Today's strategy, today's uh, session is on coping strategies for a warmer climate, <clears throat> irrigation and canopy management. Um, I thought that it was uh, somewhat ironic. We are in the middle of, uh, as you are painfully aware, I'm sure, one of the wettest winters. Uh, Greg says this winter rates as one of the top five in the last uh, 30 or so years in terms of moisture. I, I saw a uh, a statistic on the news yesterday in Portland said that Portland hasn't had any days in February this year over 60 degrees. Last year it had 15 days over 60 degrees in February and the year before it had like 13. So um, uh, dealing with a warmer climate obviously not this month this year but uh, in general we we know that uh, the, the climate is getting warmer. We've the last really cool years that we had in Oregon for grape growing were 10 and 11. Seems like a long way in the rear view mirror now uh, when we look back on it. I know as we were going through those years it, uh, it seemed a little scary uh, for me anyway. Uh, my name is John Pratt. I have a small vineyard in uh, just south of Medford in the, in the Rogue Valley and um, I grow some, some varieties that are somewhat difficult to grow. I specialize in Italian varietals, Barbera, Sangiovese, et cetera. So um, I love the warm weather, but we definitely need to develop some strategies for dealing with it, and especially with varieties like Pinot Noir, which are not necessarily lovers of warm weather. Um, I, I do find it kind of ironic. I was at a climate change conference in the gorge about four or five days after the inauguration. So I'm at a climate change uh, uh, conference put on by uh, USDA was the primary sponsor of the uh, organization. And uh, the day before the event, um, many federal agencies were given notice that they were not allowed to talk about climate change. So it made for a sort of an interesting uh, a session where we weren't supposed to be talking about what was the entire thrust of the whole conference. Um, but we survived. We survived. Um, we're going to um, start out today with Mike Williams. Mike comes to us from University of California, Davis. Larry. I'm sorry. I'm, Larry Williams. I, I got, you know, like, I'll, I'd probably go to Larry Trout later, so, you know. Anyway, uh, Larry comes to us from uh, UC Davis. His research interests include uh, carbon and nitrogen uptake and partitioning in grapevines, water relations of grapevines, and vineyard fertilization and irrigation management. He's been involved uh, at UC Davis since 1982. Larry? Uh, thank you, John. Um, I really like your jeans that you wear. I'd like you to tell me who the tailor is. <laughs> well, um, I'm going to talk today about coping strategies for a warmer climate, and it's going to be specifically on irrigation management. And there was a question asked in the previous terroir session, and um, it was uh, asked of Dr. Pogue from uh, Washington, and, and some people are asking these guys, well, why do you irrigate your vines there? Is it in Walla Walla? Was that where they were at? And my response would be, because we like to make money. <laughs> if, why, do you, why do you irrigate your vines? You, to make money, because if you did not irrigate them, you wouldn't have a harvestable crop in most locations. Now, where I'm at right now, I, I work in the San Joaquin Valley down by Fresno, and again, we're having a wet year down there. Our seasonal, our yearly average down there is 11 inches. Right now, we're at 11.5 inches of rain, and we still have two more months of, of hopefully good rainfall left. So the best way to minimize effects of drought is to keep talking about it at meetings like this, so then it continues to rain, and, and we don't have to talk about drought anymore. Okay. So, coping strategies for global warming. Okay, if you're gonna have an irrigation strategy, I'm of the opinion they should be knowledge-based. So, how many here actually irrigate your vineyards? 
Raise your hands. Oh, great. How many here know what Vineyard ET is? Holy mackerel. That's good. Or how many here would like to have an estimate of what Vineyard ET is? Okay. So, again, that's very important. How, much here, how many here actually measured the amount of water they applied last year? I don't feel I need to give a talk then. <laughs> I mean, come on. Okay, so how do you measure that? Do you have water meters? Is it at your pump? And, you know, stuff like that. How much water in the soil profile is available for consumptive water use? So how many here know how much is going to be there when you start at springtime? How many here have soil moisture sensors of some sort? Oh, geez, that's great. So how does vineyard design affect vineyard ET? If you have a VSP trellis on a six-foot row spacing, is it going to use more or less water than on an eight-foot row spacing? More, right. Um, again, Greg, why am I talking here? I don't know. Um, what fraction of ET is used between bud break and bloom, bud break and verasion, and bud break and harvest? All right, I have a slide for that that I'll show you guys here today. <laughs> so um, this is from the California Sustainable Wine Growing Alliance, and the question is, is if you can't, you can't manage what you don't measure. And so that's a good thing. Whenever I've done my irrigation studies, I always use inline, in e, drip line water meters. I know exactly how much I apply. I uh, base all of my studies on this here. So one simple thing, 45 bucks, you can put in that inline um, water meter and it'll measure how much you apply. That's very good. So important management decisions include when should I initiate irrigation at the beginning of the season? And how much water should I apply? Now, the other stuff is, you know, how, how reliable is your water supply and a few other things here. So the design of your irrigation system, how does it affect your ability to irrigate your vineyards? Can, all of, can everybody here irrigate on demand? If you decide to irrigate that morning, you're ready to go. Gee, many Christmas. Um, my talk is based on the fact that I thought, I, I wrote up something for, um, I, I sent to Carrie uh, for the Oregon Symposium here. And it's vineyard irrigation scheduling, the basics. And I just talked to Carrie, and she says in a couple days she will put, them online, put that uh, Word document online and another article that I sent her. So that will be there, so I'll, I'll have a few other things. So the goal of your irrigation management should be to grow your vines with a uniform degree and pattern of water stress. And this may be a little bit different than, let's say, table grapes in California, where you don't want to stress your vines. To do this, you need to adjust irrigation timing and amount, so it, you need to adjust when you start irrigating at the beginning of the season, and once you start irrigation, how much you want to actually apply. And what affects that once everything's in there, your, your vineyard's in, your row spacing, your can, uh, canopy, everything is there. Weather is what is going to affect how much water and when to apply it. And so there's an equation here, it's ETC, or evapotranspiration, equals reference ET times a crop coefficient. ETO is reference ET for grass in California. I'm pretty sure here in Oregon, your reference ET is based on alfalfa, is that correct? So it's ETR, or ET, something like that. So using this equation, the hardest part is getting the crop coefficient, and it is the fraction of water used by your crop compared to reference. And I've done it calculated as a function of degree days, and that reliable crop coefficient should take into account the seasonal growth of the vine. So your KC starts out low, increases the canopy, increases once you get the maximum canopy, it, it levels off and stays there for the rest of the season. Final canopy size is a function of the trellis you use, whether it's a VSP or what we call a California sprawl or some type of cross arm on it. Row spacing, the closer the row spacing you have for the same type of trellis, the more water you're going to use. And lastly, we have possible differences in growth due to cultivar and or rootstock. I was always of the opinion that it had no, that the, the trellis affected it, but I did a study with Alex Levin down at the Kerniak Center, and lo and behold, uh, Petit Verdot doesn't grow as big as everything else. <laughs> so um, you may have to take that into account. 
And you can get a reliable crop coefficient by measuring the amount of shade cast on the ground beneath the canopy at solar noon. And the equation is the Kc equals 0 0.017 times percent shaded area. And, and the percent shaded area is the area of shade divided by the area per vine, and it's a whole, and it's a whole number. So if your shaded area is 20%, you multiply 20% times 0 0.017, and you get a Kc of 0.34. It's as simple as that. In that Word document that you're going to get, I have a KC for a VSP trellis on five different row spacings, for a quadrilateral cordon uh, train vine, for a lyre train vine, and so forth. So all those are on there. Hopefully, if you need to use them, you can. You can. Oh, and th they look like this. So again, different row spacings, different canopy type and so forth, and this is the, the crop coefficient, and it's all based on a, a function of degree days. So these are some of the topics that, that Greg Jones sent me, uh, how to deal with less than full soil moisture at the beginning of the season, how best to initiate, when to, best to initiate irrigation, how best to monitor soil water status, and so forth. So I'm going to try to cover all these in about five minutes, okay? Got it. Vineyard ET, 101, the basics. Definitions, I want to give you some background here. Transpiration passed through a plant. Stomatal conductance is a measure of how open or closed the stomata are. That's what loses water vapor from your plant. Crop ET is transpiration plus evaporation in the soil profile. Reference ET uh, or, uh, is what we get in California from Simus, and leaf water potential is a measure of how uh, water status of a plant. This is how you calculate ET, and what does it mean? As net radiation increases, ET increases. As VPD increases, or as relative humidity becomes lower, ET increases. And as wind increases, ET increases. Straightforward. That's all you need to know. So I have something called a weighing lysimeter at the Kearney Ag Center. It's a big flower pot that weighs about 25 tons sets on a truck scale, and we measure water use from these vines. And I don't want to say unfortunately, but fortunately, they're Thompson seedless grapevines. So what happens? As the sun comes up in the morning, ET increases here. Here's net radiation up here. ET increases. As the sun goes down in the afternoon, ET decreases. It follows more closely the pattern of, of solar radiation and not temperature. We can see the highest temperature is over here when, in fact, we're starting to decrease already. So temperature is not the driving force of ET, but net radiation is. If you have an overcast day, or if the, if the clouds move in, ET drops off dramatically. As long as it's overcast, you use less water than you would if the sun is shining. This is an illustration of the soil moisture terms. Here's field capacity up here, readily available water, permanent wilting point. So this is the amount of water that's available to your plant. Most people assume that readily available ET is not changed with readily available water. What happens is, you, in the lysimeter, you turn the pump off, ET decreases, you decrease soil water content, and what happens is, once you bego, get below field capacity, ET actually decreases here. There's not this, it's going to remain constant until you deplete 50% of that water and then so forth. As soon as you get below field capacity, it decreases. Now, that's not a bad thing. You don't want to maybe use as much water as you can. Here's what happens with, I, I would also like to point out that a Dr. Vinay Pajay, is that his name, uh, did some work here in southern Oregon, and he actually measured ET was 32% was from nighttime transpiration. I never get nighttime transpiration. Maybe it's the Thompson Seedless. Now, if you stress your vines, maybe there's a little bit of nighttime transpiration, but it's certainly not 32%. So most of the water you're going to use is used during the daytime, not at night, as far as I'm concerned. The other thing is this. How many here have heard of sap flow sensors, where you measure the amount of water going through a trunk with sap flow sensors? We turn the water off on July 11th, and this is July 22nd here. We kept the water off, and then we re-irrigated the vines. And what it showed in this particular slide shows that transpiration almost went back to normal after over a month without water. 
But notice that we applied water uh, for three hours and we got 20 gallons per vine. So if you have stressed your vines for a long time and you want to get them back going normally again, you're going to have to apply a lot of water to get them going. You don't want to apply two or three gallons and expect that they're going to recover dramatically. Again, we had seven one-gallon emitters per vine, so we applied water for three hours and got it back to 20 gallons. Vineyard ET is a function of the amount of light intercepted by the canopy. So as I said earlier, bigger trellis, bigger ET. As trellis width increases, as row spacing gets narrow, it increases, and this is the data that actually shows that happening. So this is percent shaded area, this is water use here. It's a linear function, it increases linearly. What percentage of ET is due to transpiration versus that due to soil evaporation? Anybody here have an idea? What we did is we covered the lysimeter with plastic. We put it on and take it off. And what we found is that grapevine water use was reduced about 11%. Now, I also did it previously to this, and we saw that it's reduced by about 15%. So when you irrigate your vines like I did every day, 15 to 11 to 15% is being lost via the soil. If you're a wine grape grower and you're irrigating maybe once a week, then the amount of water that's being trans evaporated from the soil is probably much less than 10%. So again, you're, you're very good. A lot of growers think if I put in underground drip irrigation, that's going to save some water. It could save some, but probably not that much. So how do you deal with less than a full soil profile at the beginning of the season, and is it a problem? How many here think it's a problem? 2015, it was a problem. Okay, oops. So, we have gotten delayed shoot growth. I've noticed, I, on Thompson Seedless one summer, or one spring, we got abscission of the clusters, it was that dry. We got reduced yield also, and this was done by a study by uh, Nick DeKuzlin and the guys at Gallo down in California, where they covered the soil with tarp during the winter time to keep water off. And then they compared what happened after the spring occurred, and they, they didn't start irrigation until 22 and, and 16 May in 2009 and 2011. So you can have a problem if you don't get water to the soil profile. So this is the study I did at Kearney where FC here stands for field capacity is about 22%. The only time over the course of this study that I was actually at field capacity was in 20 or 1993 for these two treatments here. Every, every other year it was less. So maybe you don't need to have a, a, a wet soil profile. Well, what happened here in, this is shoot length in, in 1991, and this is for my 0.2 irrigation treatment, and I had a zero. There was delayed shoot growth, as we see here, and also the clusters fell off the vines for the zero and the 0.2. Not in these here. The next year, in 1992, soil matrix potential was the same on this date as it was on this date. So why in 1992 did it not respond like it did in 91? I don't know. In 1991, during March, we had something called the Miracle March. We had two inches of rainfall to March and nine inches of rainfall in Fresno during March. So that was a Miracle March, but we still got these clusters to abscise. Was water potential a factor here? You know, uh, minus 11 bars or minus 10 bars here. It's not, they're not that stressed, but for some reason, we dropped clusters there. So I've always told growers, I said, if you don't get the water you need during, this, the, during the winter rainfall here, don't put it on during the winter time. I would wait till close to, to bud break and see if it's gonna rain, and if you're not, then I would apply water. And I don't talk about applying water to two to three gallons per vine. I'm talking like another 20 gallons or 30 gallons of those vines, not just the minimal amount to make sure they grow okay. So how much does rainfall contribute to water requirements in the San Joaquin Valley? Oops. Most people assume if it rains an inch, a half of that is effective. Um, I did a study on, on Chardonnay up in Carneros, and I looked I calculated effective rainfall like this. So effective rainfall equals rainfall amount minus a quarter of an inch or, or 6.3 millimeters times 0.8. And I found that this to be reliable during the growing season. 
So I then went back to my data from the Kearney Ag Center, and I calculated rainfall during 90 to 94, and then this is the change in soil water content between the end of the season and the first of the next season. We got, three, we got 12 inches of rainfall, and only 50% of that was effective. So that's okay. Uh, 57, 57, 37, and 40 percent. We had a lot of this. I think this is a record rainfall year in, Cal in, in the Fresno area, about 17 inches, but only 40 percent of that was effective rainfall that actually remained in the soil profile. So even though this may be a wet year down in Medford, we don't know whether or not you're going to actually refill that soil profile to fill capacity, or do we? I don't know. So how deep in the, how deep in the soil do grapevines use water? Uh, at the, when I set up a trial, I put access tubes underneath the vine, midway between the rows and midway between them, and I measure soil water content down to 3 meters or 10 feet. So this is uh, Carnero Chardonnay up in the Napa, it's a clay loam soil. What we can see here is that this is what it looks like at uh, June 9th, pretty full soil profile. This is on September 29th, and what we see is that if you irrigate it at 25% of ET, you do deplete water, and you deplete it pretty much down to two meters. So that's down to six feet or a little bit more. Now this morning, uh, Dr. Van Leeuwen talked about if growing vines uh, without irrigation, they have the capability of going deeper, but again, I, I would say in this situation here, they, only use, they did only use water down to two meters. They, they could have gone even deeper because this is the soil profile we had here. The other thing, this is the Kearney Ag Center. This is a, a um, sandy loam type of soil here. This is the 0.2 treatment, the 0.6. So these were irrigated at 20 and 60% of ET. And what we have here, I have emitters, or I have access tubes in the row, between rows, and mid-row. And I did it early in the season and late in the season. And the reason I'm showing this is that one, they, they did take water down to about two to two and a half meters down deep. So your vines can go deep if, if the soil profile is, is, is adequate enough. But the question here is that if you put in tensiometers or watermarks in the row, does it reflect what's happening mid row? And the data I have, at least for these things here, is that if whatever is in rows is actually less than what's between rows, but again, you are using water out to the middle of the row, and that probably your soil moisture sensors in a row fairly reflect what's happening in the entire soil profile. So I think that's good. The other thing is that we, we notice here that the soil water content of the in row uh, access tube for these are actually less than these, but Unfortunately, these vines were irrigated whenever they used two millimeters of water. <laughs> so they could be irrigated 10 times a day during the summer. So that's why we have this very high value here, over here. Even though you're, you're applying 10 times a day, you're only applying 20% of ET, so that's probably mostly uh, soil evaporated there. So how much water do grapevines use? Everybody, most people here said they know what ET is. So. This is a uh, VSP trellis, meter by meter. This is a uh, vertically split canopy, a horizontally, split, oh, horizontally split canopy, vertically split canopy, and this is what we call a California sprawl in California. And we grow table grapes down there. We use these open gable trellis systems here. And earlier in the season, 100% of the canopy was shading the floor. What do you think the crop coefficient would be? It's 1.4. <laughs> it's really high. So how much do these open gable trellis systems use? 47 inches. I hate to say this, this is about like almonds down there. They, you know, they, two foot cross arm, about 36 inches. Uh, quad cordons, 36 inches. California sprawl, 31 inches on 11 foot row spacing. If we went to a 10 foot row spacing, 34 inches. If we went to a 12 foot row spacing, down to 28. So as you get wider rows, you use less water per acre. Liar type trellises and a VSP. And again, the VSP, not too many people plant a VSP in 11 foot, but I, I showed this for example here. How much water do grapevines use that are not being irrigated? This is Chardonnay up in Napa and Carneros. No water applied here. 
I determined ET by using a water budgeting method here, and so the 260 there and 249, they used about 10 inches of water. So in that location, you can grow grapes. On just dry farming, you use about 10 inches of water, and I told a, a grower up there, he says, well, that's what I thought they used up there. If you don't irrigate them, they use 10 inches of water. And so um, it looks pretty close. Uh, what's interesting is if you irrigate it at 50% of ET here, we only applied 105 millimeters, but we used from the soil 201, and we used 165 here. So just because you irrigate at 50% of ET doesn't mean that the amount that you apply is gonna be the same that the amount that you use from the soil. The other thing is if you have a wet year, 36 inches of rainfall, you start irrigating later in the growing season. So more of the water is being used early on that you don't irrigate, and then once you decide to irrigate, then that's when this, this pulls up. How much is estimated ET affected by year? Oops. This is Carneros again. All of these ETs were determined by soil water budgeting method. And the highest we got there one year, this is a VSP uh, trellis system on a seven foot row spacing, 20 inches one year and 14 inches the next. So by using that equation that I gave you earlier on, it was able to predict this one year is gonna use less water and the year before it, we use more water. And so that's what's unique about that equation is that you can calculate how much water you need to apply and it will take into account different types, different years and so forth. And so the difference in ET between the two years were due to a combination of differences in reference ET. Reference ET was lower in 98 versus 97 and degree days. Degree days were higher in 97, lower in 98. The crop coefficient is a function of degree days. So what happens is if you have less degree days, your canopy develops at a slower rate, you use less water. So can one get an estimate of, it, of ETC in their vineyard? And what we did is we compiled, compi <clears throat> compared the way in life seminar with something called surface renewal. Has anybody here heard of surface renewal? Okay, a few of you guys. This is the equation, uh, the energy balance equation. LE here is ET. This is net radiation, the driving force. And what's luckily is that you can now go online and determine what net radiation is anywhere in the world based on day of the year and so forth. G here is, is uh, soil heat flux and on a daily basis it's pretty close to zero. So all you need to do is calculate sensible heat flux, and it's this one right here. Now you can do it with metro um, weather, w weather stations that uh, cost between $25,000 and $30,000, or you can hire Thule Industries of California. Now Thule here, it's called the evaporation sensor. Do you know what the sensor is in that thing? It's a thermocouple. And it's a thermocouple that's able to measure temperature at a very high frequency. And you plug that into the sensible heat, uh, the, the uh, energy balance equation as sensible heat. And we compared it with the lysimeter. And you know, between 2012 and 2013, they don't look too bad. Now, this is now operated as Thule Industries. It is a firm in California. Um, I'm not, I just, I know they have some stations look, do they have it here in, Cal in Oregon yet? Anybody? But if you're interested to know what ET in your vineyard, it only costs you $1,500 a year. You put it in your vineyard, he gets the data, and he sends it to you and uh, indicates a, I have no financial interest in this company whatsoever, okay? I, I promise you that, okay. Oh, here we go. How much water is used by vines as a function of phenology throughout the growing season? How much is used between bud break and bloom? 10%. That's all. 10%. Um, I did it on Thompson Seedless, on Chardonnay up in Napa, on Merlot in the San Joaquin Valley, and 16 different cultivars grown at the Kearney Ag Center. So if you uh, let's say total ET is 32 inches. How much do you need to get you to bloom? Only 3.2 inches. 
you may have enough in the soil profile that you don't need to irrigate. And so that's what this, is interest, this information is useful for. And it's also, if you have a means of determining how much water is in the soil profile, then you can say, okay, I can wait till then. Between bud break and veraison, uh, for both of these two white cultivars, it's around 40%. For Merlot and these other reds, it's about 50%. Now, I don't know whether most people would have enough water in the soil profile to get you through to veraison, but you may be close. We don't know. And so 50%, you, well, okay, you need about uh, 16 inches of, of water here, so you, you, may, you may not be able to do that. Uh, how much is uh, to harvest? You know, it all depends on when you harvest and, and the location that you're, you're growing your vines in. So, how to design irrigation strategies for different profiles? This is some of the questions that, that Greg sent me. And I assume it's different textures and different soil depths. Is, would that be it? Something like that. And when best to initiate irrigation, and whether is it best to irrigate deeply and infrequently or more frequently and shallower? Don't know, you know? <laughs> it's a good, that's a good question, Greg. I, no. I, so when do you decide to irrigate? You can, you can measure the depletion of water in soil profile. So that's when you have your soil moisture sensors. You can water budget. You can Calculate ET and say, this is how much I want to deplete in the soil, and then I'll start irrigating. Or you can use plant-based methods, water potential or something else like that. Um, to start irrigation, uh, an estimate of the amount of water in the soil profile uh, can be determined with a neutron probe, capacitance sensors, so sets. I assume most, a, a good estimate of rooting depth is probably between four and five. I'd at least go down to 1.5 meters or, four, or, four, or five feet. Uh, what you do is an irrigation event would take place once a predetermined value would be determined. Water budgeting, you use that ET times ETO times KC. You say, okay, this is how much water my vines are using. This is how much I have in my soil profile that I want to deplete. And this is an example here. I compared growing uh, grapevines in a sandy loam soil in the San Joaquin Valley versus a clay loam soil up in Oakville. I assume both of the trellises were 11 foot row spacing, California sprawl, available depletion is 50%. And so based on this, I would start irrigating near Fresno on May 19th, and I wouldn't start irrigating until June 19th. And again, this is based on differences in soil water holding capacity here, different soil types and different locations. So do vineyards on lighter soils require more water once irrigation is commenced? Well, theoretically, they don't. If you keep that soil at, at field capacity, vines on, on, on a, a sandy soil are going to use just the same amount as water on a, a, a clay soil. What happens is you'd, if you start differentially irrigating them, so the sandy loam soil, you're going to start irrigating earlier. And if you do irrigate the sandy soil, you're going to do it at a higher frequency because you don't want to leach that water below the root zone here. So your frequency would be greater, but the amount may not be greater than, than on the uh, Clay loam soil. How best to monitor? You holding up something back there? Oh, already? Okay. How best to monitor plant water status? I've used pre dawn, midday, and midday leaf water potentials, stomatal conductance and photosynthesis, correlated all of them with soil water content and soil matrix potential. I measure canopy temperature, crop water stress index. Remote sensing using unmanned vehicles to calculate the crop water stress index and other stress indices. And what do you think? They're all highly correlated with one another. They're, high, they're highly correlated with soil matrix potential. This is a water potential. I don't like pre-dawn. One, because you have to get up before dawn. Uh, midday is much better. Midday and, and leaf and midday stem are, are very close to one another. Uh, midday leaf water potential highly correlated here with soil water content. And so again, in general, most of the plant-based techniques I've used are highly correlated with one another and with soil water content. Whichever one you use is the one you're most comfortable with. I would like to point out that most people do not know how to measure leaf water potential properly. You need to put the leaf in a bag right before you cut the petiole and put it in the pressure chamber. 
And the, there was a study done in France comparing leaf and stem water potential, and unfortunately, they didn't measure leaf water potential correctly at that time. And so that's why they feel that stem water potential is more effective. How do temperature spikes affect vineyard ET and how to best mitigate them? I was luckily up in Napa in 2002 doing some work up there. And, it's, and I was up there at the end of June and at, on the 9th of July, they got a heat spike here. Uh, at, at the Sima station, it measured 105 and I talked to other people and they, they measured 113. And so what happens is it was pretty warm on the 1st of July, then it gets down to about 75, and then we get a peak again, and then it goes down again and so forth here. And so what I have here is this is ETO as percent of mean in July, so the mean would be right here. Our peak increased reference ET by 30%. So would grapevine ET by 30 increased by 30%? Well, if, if you are basing everything on this equation here, yes, it was going to be increased by 30%. But it only occurred for two or three days and then went back down. So did you need to cope with it? Maybe you could have applied a little bit more water, perhaps. Uh, what we've also found is that grapevine ET has been shown to, in Australia, at that high temperatures, upregulate stomatal conductance, which means at um, very high temperatures, VPD becomes very low, stomata open and let more water vapor out. So transpiration increases. But we've also shown that as VPD increases, stomatal conductance also decreases. So there's these two opposing forces here. One increases, the other decreases, and so forth. Now, are there other things that, that heat spikes may do? Uh, when I went back up there on July 8, 18th, how many here during the heat spike get sunburn on your fruit? So this is before verasion. Sunburn, this is Cabernet, and I think it's really interesting. You know, why does that one sunburn there, but this one isn't sunburn over here? It's, it's really interesting to me. But uh, you can also got, get berry shrivel. Uh, this is, uh, so what I did is I had a trial. I'm looking at zero and 75% of ET. I had two rootstocks, one 10R and uh, 5C and I had three different uh, trellis types. One was this VSP, meter by meter. Oops. A liar trellis system. And so this is sunburn. So VSP, meter by meter, 5C, 110R, zero, 75% uh, of ET. 90% of the clusters of the 5C were sunburn. Of 110R, only 77% 77 only 77 were sunburn. Uh, if you look at desiccated clusters, 5C, 70 and 46%, and 19 and 17%. So the only trellis I got desiccation of clusters was on that VSP meter by meter. Anybody know why they desiccated? Did you see how high the, the fruit zone off the soil was? It's about this tall. And so that, that heat coming off that soil probably just desiccated those clusters like that. We have uh, the VSP uh, on a nine foot row spacing, much less sunburn. And we had the liar on a, um, again on 11, on, yeah, 11 foot row spacing. And again, there was still a lot of sunburn. So why did you get sunburn on the liar? I think as the sun comes down during the day, we have clusters on this side here. We have clusters on the inside over here and so forth. So again, there's an open canopy there that you can get a lot of sun to. And so my question here is, when you look at the average effects of, of treatments on clusters with sunburn, we have rootstock had more sunburn than 110R. And, and uh, the irrigation zero had a little bit more than the 75%. So by applying more water, it wasn't going to reduce sunburn in there. What I think the big effect was the rootstock here. And so does anybody know why the 110 rootstock had less sunburn? It's a little bit more vigorous. It puts out more lateral shoots in it. It shaded that. So again, that's where a rootstock might come in and, and minimize any effect of these heat spikes, especially on sunburn. So again, for great berries of sunburn, I'm of the opinion you need uh, high ambient temperatures for two to three hours, intermittent exposure of individual berries to direct solar radiation. 
You need to provide good canopy coverage uh, while light can be beneficial, minimize fruit exposure during the hottest part of the day. And so this is where we're talking road direction and or trellis type that might minimize or might uh, uh, include more shading on the fruit there. Um, how to deal with the possibility of losing water supply before harvest? Uh, I had a study with Max, with Max, with Alex Levin, and we cut water off at Verasion. Now, this is much, long, much more before you guys would, would lose your water supply down here. And what happens if you cut water off that early? Well, uh, probably within two weeks, you get a lot of leaves falling off the vines. Uh, did we ever notice any sunburn or any, you know, this is a verasion, so it'd be hard to see whether we had sunburn on it. So you can do that, minimize sunburn, but again, you're going to, what happens here when we harvest them, let me show it here. Um, the first year I did this, uh, this is where we, we shut it off at verasion here. I harvested everything at the same time, and these had higher sugar. Um, 2015, uh, Alex got kind of lazy, and we decided to harvest everything at the same time. And um, it, was, it, was 20, it was 28 bricks. <laughs> yeah, hang time. Hang time down in the San Joaquin Valley is going to be very beneficial to fruit quality here because they shrivel up little things in here. So again, I, I think if, if the water is cut off early, make sure there's no cover crop out there. Make sure you minimize the amount of water that's going somewhere else. Make sure the vines are using it. Time? Okay. <laughs> Conclusions. Now, the, uh, the, the last part I was going to go through here would be on one of those uh, Word documents that Theoretically, Carrie's going to show. Oh, I'm sorry. It's even. Wow, how many conclusions? Okay. Things you can do to assist in irrigation management. First thing is get an estimate of ET for your vineyards. And the, one of the easiest way to do it would be to get a crop coefficient and get reference ET from somewhere and go through and calculate that using historical data or whatever. In the raisin manual that we produce in California, we have those values for raisin vineyards. We use historical ETO values, historical degree date values. I got one minute. Collect degree days from bud break each year and determine de degrees as a function of phenological events. That was pointed out earlier. Let's look at phenological events when they occur in your particular vineyard. Download ETO data, again, from your um, weather station. You get down here. Download rainfall amounts and events. Measure applied water amounts as a function of time. And then if you have all this data, what you can do is come up with, I call, an irrigation coefficient. Something that you as a grower say, OK, this is what my vines theoretically use based on my data. I'm only going to apply 50% of that. So I'm going to do sustained deficit irrigation or, regular, or regulated deficit irrigation for my vineyard. And that way you have it for yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you, Larry. Next up we have, no, Mike. <laughs> Mike, uh, Mike Trott comes to us from uh, New Zealand. He was, um, in 1984, he was moved to Marlborough as officer in charge of the new research center, managing much of the early grape research in the developing wine industry. From 92 to 2000, he was senior lecturer in viticulture at Lincoln University. In fact, there's many of his former students in, the, in attendance today. He joined uh, uh, Villa Maria Wines at its Marlboro Regional uh, as um, uh, the regional viticulturist from 2000 to 2004 before returning to scientific career where he's been a principal scientist with plant and food research at the Marlboro Re uh, Wine Research Center. He's an adjunct uh, uh, professor at Lincoln University right now and in 2015 was inducted as a fellow into the New Zealand Wine Growers and for service to the New Zealand uh, wine industry. Welcome, Mike. Thank 
Kia ora, everybody. Um, that means welcome um, in Māori. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, it's always one of these interesting things when you know, somebody asks you to talk about drought and irrigation and heat stress and it's pouring with rain outside and freezing cold. But I did get an email or a text message from my wife this morning and it says, hot, over 30 degrees centigrade here today. Um, sort of, we are suffering. Take care. So um, I was asked by the organisers to talk briefly about um, coping strategies for warmer climates, irrigation, and canopy management. Last week, I was at the Wine and Food Festival in Blenheim. Um, here we are. Yeah, great, isn't it? Sort of. But it made me think a little bit about, you know, what's the similarity between the people sitting out here can you see that? Yeah. And grapes in a vineyard. Okay. Well, the similarity are two things. First of all, if they're not in the shade, they're getting very, very hot. Um, look at these people without hats on. And if they don't keep themselves hydrated, they start to suffer. And I can assure you that for about two or three days after the Wine and Food Festival, there was a lot of suffering in Marlborough. Um, uh, probably rather like grapevines. New Zealand's a little island or a couple of islands um, in the South Pacific. We're a long way from anywhere. Um, we, we receive hot winds from Australia. We tend to get these westerlies coming in. And we also get these very cold winds from the Antarctic. And I was saying to somebody um, earlier on that actually on about the 10th of January, we had a minus 0.5 centigrade frost at ground temperature. So we get these huge fluctuations. And as I say, we're currently going through a heat spike that has come from Australia. You might have heard about the fires they're having there. They sweep across the Tasman Sea and they hit us um, right in the, where it hurts. Um, the, uh, we, we're currently just about to go into Verizon. So things are ripening or starting to ripen. We're running about 10 days behind average. This is where we sit relative to um, you here in uh, the northwest. Um, basically, the south part of um, New Zealand is about equivalent to Portland, and um, the North Island is down here in the south of California. Marlborough sits here on the boundary between California and Oregon, I guess, somewhere there, yeah? Um, but of course, as I say, we're surrounded by this ocean, so our, temperate is, our uh, climate is quite temperate. Marlborough is the centre for the wine industry. Um, we currently grow something like 36,000 hectares, of which the majority of it is Sauvignon Blanc. But Pinot Noir is increasingly important. And if we look at the Marlborough region in, in itself, you'll see that most of our grapes, again, are Sauvignon Blanc, but Pinot Noir um, is particularly important to us. So warming temperatures are a challenge and a concern to many grape growers around the world. I have a, um, a saying when I first started to write about this, was, you know, plan for the best, plan, hope for the best, but plan for the worst. We are trying to predict into the future. We don't know what the future is going to hold, um, but we need to plan for it. What are the possible long-term changes and how might one deal with them? Well, you need to be proactive. And we've heard from a number of speakers that one of the best ways of dealing with the challenge is to actually think about what that challenge might mean to you um, in the future. I'm going to talk about some of the work that we've been doing on manipulating phenology. It would be quite nice in a warming climate to be able to slow down the development of the grapevine. And I'm going to do that by particularly talking about some of the work that we've done um, on canopy management. And I'll very briefly talk about some of the sort of short-term effects of heat stress and how we might deal with them. That's my granddaughter. Come on, you're supposed to all go, ah, oh, no. <laughs> Isn't she gorgeous? Yeah. Do you realise that by the time she's my age, it'll be 2085? So one generation, by the time she's my age, 2085, what sort of world are we going to be living in? Or is she going to be living I won't be living in it. Is she going to be living in? What's the climate going to be? What's the technology going to be that she will use on a regular basis? You talk to anybody my age, and they talk about when they were doing their research, they didn't have computers. I did all my statistics using a pocket calculator. 
Um, today, I can phone my wife. Here, now. I remember when I moved to New Zealand, to phone New Zealand, you had to go through an operator, both in the UK and in New Zealand, to get a call through. Today, I can phone my brother. I won't do it now. It's probably early in the morning for him. But the world is going to change, and we need to start planning for this sort of thing. One way of starting to think about the future is to think about the past. And this is some of the phonology work that we've um, been doing um, in Marlborough. This is Sauvignon Blanc, and on the x-axis here, um, we've got the date or predicted date of flowering using this grapevine fl flowering Veraison model that Case talked about earlier that was developed by the French team ourselves, and in particular, Amber Parker. Um, and you can see from here that basically there's a general trend that flowering is or has over the past 25 years advanced from, if we take uh, this one here in central Otago to the south of the island, uh, the South Island, from about 20th of December, we're now looking at it's closer to the 10th of December. So over 25 years, we would estimate that flowering in central Otago for Sauvignon Blanc has advanced by 10 days. That's huge. It's interesting to note that Central Otago appears to be advancing faster than some of the other regions. And one of the differences between Central and the other regions is that it's much more continental. Central Otago is in the middle of the South Island, whereas the other three regions, Marlborough, Hawke's Bay and Gisborne, are much more maritime. We can do the same sort of thing for the Verizon date. Again, advancing quite dramatically. What's that, 15th of February to the 10th or um, 9th of February. It doesn't say that every year is going to be earlier. It's not. There's quite a lot of variation between seasons, but there does appear to be a general trend advancing. And this is the measure for the 20 bricks value that we use as a measure of maturity. Again, Advancing. Now, one of the things you can do when you start to get these sorts of numbers, you can start to say, well, what's the average temperature between the date of Verizon and harvest date? And what's happening is that the average temperature during that ripening phase appears to be going up. And again, it appears to be going up faster in central Otago than in the other regions. But apart from Gisborne, they're all tending to go up. Marlborough's less... Hawke's Bay a little bit less, and then Gisborne appears to have changed very little. What this suggests, that if we go out that... Sorry, I'm pointing this way. You probably can't see. So if you, you're pointing out here somewhere, it would suggest that the average temperature during ripening in Gisborne in about 20 to 30 years' time is going to be the same as it is in... Um, sorry, in, Hawke, in central Otago, is going to be the same as it is in Gisborne now. And maybe the whole country is going to come together. That's one of the concerns the Australians actually have, is that they are finding their harvests are becoming more and more compressed as they start to get re regional and national temperature increases. And, of course, that imp has implications on fruit intake into wineries and all sorts of infrastructure requirements. By the way, um, you'll notice that I've got eight bricks up here. That's the, the value that we use for Verizon. Some of the work that um, Amber and ourselves and with Case have done is we've decided that eight bricks is as good a measure of Verizon as anything. It's basically the start of ripening. It means that you can compare Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, red varieties all together. It doesn't matter. If you start to use colour or softness or something, it's very much more subjective. So, what can we do? Well, as um, I think it was Case mentioned this morning, one of the options is to start to look at different varieties. Um, again, this is the um, data that Case talked about this morning. Um, you can see that you know, if it starts to get warmer, maybe um, areas, regions traditionally that grow uh, Pinot Noir will now be growing Sauvignon Blanc. So maybe you will be famous for Sauvignon Blanc here in Oregon in 20 years' time or 30 years' time, and we will be famous for, um, is that Syrah? Yes. Um, so Burgundy won't be growing Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. It'll be growing Syrah and um, Sauvignon Blanc. 
One of the other options is to look at changing the phenolo phenological development of the vine. Now, Case this morning talked about the influence of temperature. Um, if we, what we've got here is the range of flowering dates for Sauvignon Blanc in Marlborough. And they range there from late, Feb uh, late November through to about the middle of December. And again, it, these are the, the seasonal differences for Veraison and for this 20 bricks value. If we add half a degree to the daily values, we advance flowering, Veraison, and this ripening value by a small amount, by five or six days. Um, if you add two degrees, you advance it a long way. So if we can delay, say, the date of Veraison by five or six days, we might be back into the sort of temperature warming regimes that we currently experience. So here we are. Something like 80% of our seasons fall in this temperature range here from 15 degrees through to 18 degrees. A few seasons are hotter during that ripening period, a few seasons are colder. If we add that half a degree, you can see that instead of now having 50% um, uh, of the, the season sitting at about, very difficult to see from here, um, what's that, about 17 degrees, you're down to about 20% um, of the seasons that are going to be about that, that temperature. So the frequency with which we're going to get warm ripening periods is going to increase quite noticeably. Delay the raisin by five days and they all sit over each other again. How might we delay the raisin? Well, one possible technique is to change the leaf area to fruit weight ratio, and that's something I'm going to talk about in a, mo in a moment. Um, another one is to, if you, particularly if you're spur pruning, to prune them late. And this is an experiment that one of my PhD students did, um, and basically what he did, he pruned in July, August, September, um, and late September there. And you can see the difference in the shoot development that had occurred by that time. And this delay in the shoot development, because basically the, shoots at the, the, the new shoots at the top of the cane that was sitting up here um, were basically suppressing this growth down here. And the development that was happening on these vines was quite significant. And that delayed the whole phenology of the vine during the, the subsequent season. Another approach is to use some chemicals. Christine Boucher in um, South Australia has been using naphthol acetic acid and been able to delay the onset of a raisin. The naphthol acetic acid sprayed after fruit set appears to slow down the development through to the raisin. So there are three possible options. But let's go back and talk about this leaf area to fruit weight ratio. Case commented this morning that um, the... Temperature is driving a lot of the phenology, and that's correct. But you can slow down um, the, or increase the time from flowering to raisin by reducing the leaf area. So in our experiments that we've been doing, we've basically been trimming the vines down to, from 12 leaves down to 6 leaves um, and been taking off different amounts of crop. And basically this shows that by, taking, by trimming the leaves, you increase that time from flowering to raisin. Um, if you do too much, then you also slow down the rate of sugar accumulation to the extent that um, it uh, doesn't hit your, your target. At the same time, you're having, we've, we found that we have very little effect on the acidity. So one of the consequences of doing this trimming treatment is we're changing, the, we're desynchronizing the sugar and, accumu and acid accumulation. We've done these experiments on Pinot Noir, we've done them on Sauvignon Blanc, and basically the results are very, very similar. So what we're doing by trimming, we're delaying the onset of a raisin, um, and we are slowing down the rate of sugar accumulation. But in some cases, we're not affecting some of the other metabolites. Amber, with her experiments, looked at the sort of leaf area to fruit weight ratio that was required to change both the date of a raisin and the, date of, and, and the rate of sugar accumulation. And she found that basically about 
half a metre of leaf area per um, kilo of fruit was sufficient to pretty well optimise the rate of, um, or, or the date of uh, Verizon. The difference between these two lines are the difference in the genetics between Sauvignon Blanc and Pinot Noir. In contrast, the rate of sugar accumulation was unaffected by variety, at least in these two cases. Um, the leaf area that was required was slightly greater to get that optimum of a more maximum rate of sugar accumulation. So maybe one of the options are that you can basically trim reasonably tough um, to slow down the date of a raisin, but then allow the laterals to um, generate the leaf area that's required to optimise the rate of sugar accumulation. The way I like to look at it when you're looking at these synchrony of, chemical, of, of metabolites is to actually normalise everything against the sugar concentration. It makes life a little bit easier to understand and you can see here that as you increase the uh, fruit weight to leaf area ratio, as you do increasing trimming or less of fruit thinning, you're tending to result in higher, um, a lower acids at a particular soluble solids. You've got more hang time to allow those acids to decrease. Not all acids appear to behave in the same way. The tartaric acid here um, is be behaving quite differently, say, to the malic acid. Interestingly, when you look at the nitrogen, again, the, the, the nitrogen and the, the black lines there are the, well, 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 the trimmed vines. So the, 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 the black line is basically where it's been trimmed. At any soluble solids, the ammonium levels are lower. The primary amino acids tend to be higher. And it's these primary amino acids that generate many of the flavour and aroma compounds that are important in uh, Sauvignon Blanc. What are some of the short-term options? We've heard people talking about methods of measuring water stress. One of the things I do when I walk into a vineyard, I put my hand on the leaves. It's amazing how sensitive that part of your hand is to um, temperature. Put your hand on the leaves, walk around the vineyard doing this. Everybody thinks you're waving at them, but you're not. You're just measuring the degree of water stress those vines are under. If they feel warm, they're stressed. If they feel cool, they're probably not stressed. Transpiration is an energy demanding process. And that basically, if the vines are transpiring, they're using energy and that cools the leaves. The rate of photosynthesis in a vineyard or by a grapevine is influenced by the leaf temperature. Um, there's been a lot of work done out of Charles Sturt University um, in Australia looking at heat stress, by, particularly by Dennis Greer here. And you can see that there is an optimum. About 30 degrees centigrade, the rates of photosynthesis under fully illuminated conditions reach a maximum, get the temperatures above that, and it starts to decrease. They don't crash. So the rates of photosynthesis, say, here, um, at uh, 40 degrees centigrade, are actually equivalent to the same uh, vines at 20 degrees centigrade. However, if you start to get very high temperatures, these are now, we're now into 40 degrees centigrade, which I think is about 110 Fahrenheit or, or thereabouts, um, you can get damage to the um, photosynthetic system that takes time to recover. Here's Dennis again looking at a four-day um, heat shock um, at two times. Um, at flowering, they appear to recover quite quickly. Um, in that mid raisin to um, maturity phase during ripening, they're taking probably six days to recover. So the vines have been given the shock and they're taking time to, to recover and that seems to be worse um, as the fruit is ripening. One of the things about irrigation, as I say, is that it will tend to result in cooler leaves. And this is some work um, that's come out of Idaho that I was reading about preparing for this. The effect of um, irrigation on leaf temperature um, and the consequential effect of um, reduced irrigation on the frequency or the number of minutes above 30 degrees centigrade. And you can see that basically where the vines have been irrigated, the number of minutes in these experiments where the leaves were above 30 degrees centigrade is about a, about a thousand. Um, where they were on a reduced irrigation re regime, um, you're up to 6,000. And the same sort of thing happens with the fruit. The fruit, of course, is slightly, um, is, is slightly different in that basically those little berries 
there they actually absorb radiation and the radiative effect compounds any increase in air temperature. Um, but uh, irrigated berries are generally cooler than those that are in some sort of water stress. And ir irrigated berries on the, or, or water stressed berries on the western side of the canopy are even worse off. So one of the things I used to recommend to my Pinot Noir growers when I was working for Villa Maria was leave some leaf cover on the western side of the canopy. You know, protect that very hot side um, from direct radiation, direct sunlight. Take the leaves off the east side so that basically the canopy can dry out first thing in the morning when you've still got dew on them. So what other factors can influence water availability? Well, I know I'm going to flick over this fairly quickly because people have talked about it um, already. One thing I'd like to just remind you of is how poor grapevines actually are at taking water up. They have a very sparse root system. This puts them in as, as poor competitors for water um, with um, cereals or grasses or any herbaceous plant. You can see the difference there in the number of centimetres of root per square centimetre of soil surface. Grapevines, apples, cereals. Many years ago, we were doing some experiments looking at um, competition between vines. Well, we wanted to devigorate vines. So here we have a trial um, that has got chicory planted here, um, using it as a way of extracting water um, to uh, reduce vegetative growth. We had a bare ground treatment and ryegrass at the end there, and you can see the difference in the canopy. The um, chicory treatment was dry even by November, or starting to dry by November. It's that winter active, so it's using water very early on in the spring, before the canopy of a grapevine has started to develop. And this decrease in the water content in the soil profile has quite a profound influence on the amount of vegetative growth. So minimise um, competition between uh, grapevines and, and other plants. Here we are in the coat door. Um, not a lot of competition between herbaceous plants and the grapevines there. It's very interesting, actually, just as a brief aside, why the coat door has such rigorous control over their management by vineyards. I mean, this, these three rows were owned by Joe Bloggs, and these four rows over here were owned by somebody else. If you didn't have rules, could you imagine, you know, Joe Bloggs decided to put Scott Henry, three, two metre tall canopies up, and how he would get on with his neighbours? No wonder they need regulations. Unlike um, New Zealand, where we tend to have big blocks. It's a very interesting concept with terroir. Anyway, keep going. Um, one of the techniques that they're using in New Zealand now is that they cultivate alternate rows. And I was out with um, um, Chad on Saturday and seeing the sort of thing that you're using these sorts of techniques. Um, you need to have something in there, particularly on Saturday when it's pouring with rain and we were walking through this um, vineyard, I won't say up to our knees in mud, but it wasn't far off it. Um, and then, of course, you've got grass all the way through. Now, you can expect these vines here. The grass is occupying space, which means that there's less room for the, for the grapevine roots. Um, but you'll notice here, in this particular case, the grass strip is actually quite narrow. So there's a reasonably wide herbicide strip. So it's not a matter of having one size fits all. What's the row distance there? That's, um, I, I think that's a 2.2 metre row. Um, Larry mentioned under um, subterranean or uh, underground irrigation, subsurface irrigation. Um, this is something that we're looking at. Um, you can see the difference here. This is a subsurface irrigation treatment versus a um, surface irrigation treatment, the difference in the, in the weed growth. Um, one of the potential ad advantages, apart from reducing transpiration rate, is that if you bury the irrigation lateral, the water tends to spread out further, so you're now wetting a larger volume. Um, and uh, as the rate of water uptake through a particular part of the root system is very important in determining the water potential at the root surface, um, then increasing the, the wetted area is potentially an advantage. Just one final thought, though. The roots are not uniformly distributed in the profile. And rather like Larry here, as you, the system dries out, 
it tends to dry out from the surface. I also have a saying which, is, which says, if you change one thing, you change everything. So as the surface dries out, we have to be careful that we're not altering the nutrition of the vine. You can see here that the rate of nitrogen and potassium uptake by the, vines, in, by the berries increases very significantly when you get to veraison. If the vine starts to suffer from a nutritional deficiency at that time, where does it get its nutrients from? It gets the nutrients out of the leaves. As they start to suck nutrient potassium, say, out of the leaves, what does that do? It means you get potassium deficiency. We know that potassium is very important in stomatal management. In some of the trials that um, uh, we've been doing, we've been looking at both the root distribution and the nutrition from the surface horizon downwards. Now, I should just emphasize that these three pits are great in a single row of grapes about 15 to 20 metres apart. So that's the sort of variation that we can get in our vineyards. Um, but you can see that basically here most of the roots are in the soil surface. That's the bit that's going to dry out the most rapidly and at that point potassium is likely to become unavailable to the plant in the extent that it requires if that happens around the raisin. So just something to think about when you're talking about um, water stress and the effect that it might have um, on the vines. This is demonstrated quite cl clearly by these two graphs here. A wet season has a much higher potassium concentration in the must and a much higher yeast available nitrogen in the must than a dry season. The fertility levels were maintained the same but the rainfall and the amount of rain um, was quite dramatically different and that influenced the nutrition. So just to summarise, the seasons appear to be getting warmer, although the effect is not uniform. Some regions are getting warmer faster than others. And the earlier date of a raisin with increased temperatures results in a warmer ripening period. And this is a legacy that we are leaving to our grandchildren. We can delay the date of a raisin and slow sugar accumulation by reducing the leaf area. But this desynchronizes the metabolites. I've talked a little bit about nitrogen, I've talked a little bit about acids, I haven't talked about things like anthocyanins and the like. I don't know what they're going to do. Minimizing water stress means that the canopy will remain cool, and minimizing the competition between grapes and herbaceous plants will maximize water availability. But maintaining nutrition is equally important. If we want to make sure that the vines are going to perform well in a ripening period, we need to make sure they've got adequate nutrition. Thank you for listening to me, <coughs> listening to me um, and the invitation to be here this afternoon. Um, many of my colleagues at the Research Centre and students have contributed in great ways to this presentation. Um, I've got a few people there that doesn't mean that there aren't others um, that I, uh, uh, I've, uh, I, I acknowledge. Um, and much of the work that um, we've been doing is part of our research program, which is funded predominantly by the government, um, but is organised with consultation with the New Zealand wine growers. So you can now go out into the cold and the wet, or you can come to the Wine and Food Festival next year. <laughs> Thank you very much. I had a, a question about one of your last slides there. It was uh, the root distribution slide with, I think it was like the small, medium XL vines. Yep. And I was just curious if you could explain what those, each of those treatments are. Is, is it just vine density, vine spacing, and what, what were they? Can we have the slides back again? That one? 
Yeah, basically, um, this is a, 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 some data from an experiment that we did, which you can read about in the Australian Journal, where we've looked at variability in a vineyard. Um, and within the, the soil types in the, the wire round plains of Marlborough um, tend to run east-west, and the rows are planted north-south. So these vines here, these three pits, were literally within 20 metres of each other. The stony alluvial soils here tend to have the highest rooting density at the surface, um, coming down here, and also the highest potassium concentration. The soil. So the soil, yeah. The, the, we measured the rooting density by basically putting a framework against the pits um, and counting the number of roots that we could see. And when I say we, it's the royal we. I didn't do it. <laughs> Tim Mills, who, whose thesis this is, um, did it all. But even within a vineyard, it's quite, very, quite different. I, I have a question for Larry. Uh, you spoke about a lot about row spacings, but you didn't uh, address the issue of plant-to-plant -plant spacing within the row. What does that do to uh, your irrigation strategy? It says on. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Let's say you have two rows, uh, or two vineyards, and they're 10 foot between rows, okay? One vineyard has six feet between vines, and the other vineyard has four feet between vines. I'm of the opinion that water use down both rows, regardless of distance between vines, is the same. It's only you're going to irrigate the one that only has four feet between vines with less water than the one that's uh, six feet between vines. So what I'm assuming is that rows that in vine spacing down a row has no effect on the growth of that vine and so you're looking this row uses this amount of water and the same row uses this amount of water even though the distance between vines within the row differs. Uh, question for Larry. Can Does that make sense? No, it, it may not make sense, but that's what I feel. <laughs> no, you can't, you can't ask a question. No. It, it, I'll be like Donald Trump. No, no, you, no, no. no. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding here. Okay. It depends, though, if you feel your canopy. If your vines are wide apart on the row, you don't feel your canopy, you get more porosity and you get... Uh, can you repeat that, please, again? Um, it depends if you feel your canopy. If you're if right, you're right. I, I, I'm, I'm assuming that that the canopy is full okay. down the road. I mean, and, and so the, dis the difference between a four foot between vine spacing and a six foot, I assume you feel the canopy. Yes. So that row uses the same amount of water as the other row. Just individual vines use less. Yes. Okay. Have you ever measured the effects of a suspension of kale and clay sprayed on the canopy to reduce ET for another way to slow down? Would this be similar to spraying anti-transparents on vines? There's a product that was used for Pierce's disease back in early 2000s called Surround. I think okay. people are still experimenting with it as far as... Here's what I've actually done. Now, if... If, if something like that clogs the stomata, yes, you're going to reduce transpiration. Uh, four or five years ago, we sprayed epsizic acid on vines in a vineyard. And epsizic acid reduces stomata, causes the stomata to close, so you have less transpiration. And, and our thought was that we're going to conserve water by reducing transpiration. And lo and behold, you spray AB on there, and it'll closes to mana and you'll use less water. Unfortunately, in the San Joaquin Valley, if you have days that are between 95 and 100 degrees Fahrenheit and you close this to mana, you burn the leaves. So if indeed that solution that you spray on your vines clogs the stomata and it gets extremely hot, you'd have to worry about leaf burn on that. I don't know what it would do on the uh, fruit itself, but it'd be interesting. I have a question over can here. I, can I just make a quick comment on that? Um, when I was preparing my talk, I came across there are a number of publications out there um, that have looked at a kaolinite spray, and it does appear that you can use it um, without adversely affecting the fruit. The other one that I came across was people that were using 
um, salicylic acid, salicylic acid, aspirin, um, which appeared to enable the leaves to recover from a heat shock more rapidly than um, the rates that I was showing up there. So, you, you know, the, the photosynthetic rate was going back up again. The thing to remember with all of this is that, of course, any reduction in transpiration will also tend to have an equivalent reduction in the rates of photosynthesis. Rates of photosynthesis and transpiration are actually quite closely linked. When you were using acetic acid, NAA, for um, delaying veraison, did you notice any um, effects for wine quality? Um, that wasn't my research. As I said, that was Christine Boucher in South Australia, and I think I'd have to go back to the original um, um, publication. I will make one comment, though. It's quite possible she, could, she would change the fruit and the wine composition. Whether that has an effect on quality is a very subjective thing. They, they do apply abscisic acid in California on table grapes to increase color. So it is being used there in California now. But of course, table grapes are harvested at 18 to 19 bricks, so it never gets that high. Other questions? I, I have to make a comment. I'm impressed with the amount of people here that actually measure soil water content, uh, have water meters, and actually know what ET is in their vineyards. Great. <laughs>